While Magic the Gathering is perhaps best known for its wide variety of fantastical creatures and monsters, its worlds are often filled with more common animals as well. There have been over 300 creatures with a bird creature type and multiple birds have popped up in competitive decks throughout the game's history. And today we're looking at 10 of the most impactful birds in Magic the Gathering. Starting off at number 10, we have Teshar Ancestor's Apostle. This card is a legendary bird cleric that costs 3 generic and 1 white mana and has 2 power and toughness. Like most birds, Teshar has the keyword ability flying, which means it can only be blocked by creatures with flying or reach. Every bird on this list has the keyword flying, so while it's an upside, it's not a factor for the purposes of this list. What makes Teshar important is its other abilities. Whenever you cast a spell of the appropriate type, you may return a creature with mana value 3 or less from the graveyard to the battlefield. Specifically, this ability triggers whenever an artifact, saga, or legendary spell is cast. Collectively, these are called historic spells and received focus and support in the set Dominaria. That set is where Tashar was first printed, but that set also introduced Kethys, the Hidden Hand. Kethys not only makes legendary spells like Tashar cost 1 generic mana less to cast, but more importantly, Kethys allows you to exile 2 cards from your graveyard to give every legendary card in your graveyard the ability to be cast from there until the end of the turn. This formed the core of a combo deck built around Kethys that sought to mill as many cards as possible with Diligent Excavator, triggering on historic spells, and then casting cheap and free legendary cards like Mox Amber repeatedly. Teshar provides further support to this deck by bringing more of the milled cards back from the graveyard and opening up even more combo lines with Mox Amber. This deck was quite good in standard at the time of its release and has since seen variants of it crop in formats like Pioneer and even Modern. However, these have seen limited success and no real high level tops. However, Teshar and the deck it helped create once defined the standard meta, and still sees experimentation in other formats to this day, which is enough to at least get it the 10th spot on this list. And at number 9, we have Nimble Obstructionist. This creature is a bird wizard with 3 power, 1 toughness, and costs 2 generic and 1 blue mana. It has the aforementioned flying keyword, as well as the keyword flash. Flash means it can be cast at instant speed. Nimble Obstructionist has a third keyword as well, because for 2 generic and 1 blue mana, you may instead choose to cycle the card instead of casting it. Cycling discards the card in question, then draws a card to replace it, leaving it to essentially be neutral in card advantage. What makes Nimble Obstructionist a playable card is that whenever it's cycled, you counter an activated ability or trigger ability you don't control. Trickbind style counter spells that counter abilities instead of the spell itself are generally not competitively viable for simply being too situational or narrow. While these spells could be used to counter Planeswalker's ultimate ability, or any number of strong triggers, they do very little to stop the actual spells that might cause trouble on following turns. And when dealing with an onboard threat, it instead often is better to just destroy or exile that creature. However, by attaching this effect to Nimble Obstructionist, it both provides value in replacing itself with the drawn card, and by having the flexibility to be used as a creature instead. While casting Nimble Obstructionist does not counter anything, it's still a 3 power creature with flying that can help push for damage. Nimble Obstructionist has seen off and on play in multiple formats since its initial printing. Its most consistent home is in Modern, however, where various decks take use of it in limited capacities. Of note, the four color control decks in the format already run Elementor's Call to search creature spells at instant speed, and as such, a creature-based counter like this has value. These decks tend to just run a single copy of Nibble Obstructionist, since in most matchups they won't want to draw it, but on the ones they do, they'll be likely to draw into Elementor's Call to search for it. And at number 8, we have Empyrean Eagle. This bird spirit costs 1 generic, 1 white, and 1 blue mana, while having 2 power and 3 toughness. Not only does it have flying, it gives every other creature you control with flying plus 1 plus 1. This effect works with any creature with flying and not just any one specific creature type, presented apart from other similar lord effects that buff a specific group of creatures. Empyrean Eagle sees play in specifically spirit aggro decks, most specifically those in pioneer format. Aggressive decks built around a single creature type often seek out these lord effects to allow their swarm of creatures to be more imposing in later stages of the game. Decks running these lords tend to run only creatures that benefit from its ability, and often run as many lords as possible as well to maximize their power. In Pioneer in specific, it also works well with Collected Company, allowing for a surprise boost in power if the Eagle happens to be within those top cards of the deck. Most every spirit has flying, so Empyrean Eagle provides support to the other cards of the deck. An Eagle itself is also a spirit, so it gains a boost from the other lord in the deck, Supreme Phantom. Other spirit decks in formats like Modern, however, don't use Empyrean Eagle because other options exist that aren't legal in Pioneer, such as the other spirit lord, Drog Skull Captain, which provides further protection for spirits. Despite only being playable due to better options not being legal, Empyrean Eagle earns its spot at least this high thanks to at least being a consistent staple in Pioneer Spirits, and likely will remain one until Drogskull Captain or other lords are printed for the archetype in the future. But then, another creature type focused on flying might one day rise to be a meta and give Empyrean Eagle a second home. Coming in at number 7, we have Gilded Goose. This bird costs a single green mana and has zero power and two toughness and flying. When it enters the battlefield, you create a food token. 
Food tokens are artifacts that you can pay 2 generic mana, tap, and sacrifice to gain 3 life. Gilded Goose can also create a food token by paying 1 generic and 1 green and tapping Gilded Goose. Alternatively, you can tap Gilded Goose and sacrifice a food token to add 1 mana of any color. Food tokens only providing life meant they were inherently weak on their own, especially in the early game where taking the time to spend the mana on cracking one is generally inadvisable. Generally, the early game is about establishing your own presence and advancing your board state or card advantage, which gaining life does not do. Gilded Goose helps shore up this weakness by taking those food tokens and turning them into sources of mana. Although this mana only lasts for that phase and cannot stay for multiple turns, it does allow the player to get ahead of mana to deploy a threat a turn before it normally would have been able to be played and hopefully snowball that advantage. And then in the late game, where there's more than enough mana already on board, Gilded Goose can provide more food tokens to be used with Trail of Crumbs to draw into more cards and eventually win conditions. This proved to be a potent strategy and standard at the time of its printing and later on with the release of Modern Horizons 2 would see a slight resurgence in the modern format. The Underworld Cookbook provided a low-cost food engine that combined with cards like Feasting Troll King for an explosive deck that could put out a lot of power, oblique not the most consistently. Gilded Goose is a key card in these decks, although it's safe to say it is far from meta anymore. However, it was an ever-present staple in its standard format and still sees playing rogue decks to this day. And at number 6, we have Aarakocca Sneak. With a cost of 3 generic and 1 blue mana, this bird rogue has 3 power and 4 toughness and flying. When it enters the battlefield, you gain the initiative which is a designation a player has until another player takes it from them. Whenever a creature a player controls deal combat damage to you, that player takes the initiative for you. Whenever the initiative is taken or at the beginning of that player's upkeep, they venture into the Undercity. The Undercity is a token representing a branching path with various effects, with each venture trigger allowing the player to go further into one or more room on the path. This was initially for a multiplayer format where the initiative would pass between up to four players back and forth. However, this mechanic is far more powerful in traditional magic where it's one person versus another. This mechanic has made waves in other formats, but specifically saw fast dominance in the Popper format. Popper specifically only has cards of the common rarity legal, meaning many high power threats that warp other formats were never even legal at all in Popper. Multiple common creatures such as Aarakocra Sneak are granted initiative when they enter the battlefield. Generally speaking, the best creatures for this were ones that cost the least mana. The mechanic quickly overtook the format for how quickly the advantage snowballed, and how hard it was for a single player to take the initiative from one player actively trying to protect it. Multiple cards were banned to curb the mechanic's dominance. Aarakocra Sneak was seen as one of the best initiative granters in the format, seeing as how blue was seen as both one of the best colors to be playing initiative in Popper. Beyond that, the flying keyword in this case is actually somewhat more relevant, as it specifically makes taking back the initiative easier, since flying creatures are much harder to block. As one of only two birds to currently be on any ban list, Aarakocra Sneak deserves at least the sixth spot. However, while Popper is a powerful format, Generally speaking, its creatures are often its weakest components. And while some blue decks in Legacy have been toying with initiative, generally formats with higher rarity initiative cards have stronger options like White Plume Adventurer. Generally speaking, a big part of Aarakocra Sneak's playability came more from it being a common that had the right keyword more than the card's own power. As such, Aarakocra Sneak doesn't really make it any higher, despite other cards on this list having not been banned. And at number 5, we have Avon Mind Sensor. Two generic mana and one white mana in this case gets you a two power, one toughness bird wizard with both flash and flying. While flying is nothing new at this point, flash on Avon Mind Sensor is especially relevant. That's because its other ability is that if an opponent would search a library, that player searches the top four cards of the library instead. And thanks to flash, you're able to use this powerful effect to surprise someone after they've already used the searching effect in question. In competitive play, this is most often used against the ever present fetch lands. If an opponent sacrifices their marsh flats and you flash in an Avon Mind Sensor response, they have to hope to find a swamps or planes in those top 4 cards or else the effect will essentially fizzle and do nothing. Searching is one of the most ubiquitous actions in the game, especially in competitive formats where mana bases are built up of many fetch lands as well as often other searching effects. But what puts Avon Mind Sensor over other similar effects that limit searching is that it is asymmetrical. Avon Mind Sensor's controller may search their full library with no worries, meaning that they don't have to worry about building their deck specifically around this card to get maximum value. Thanks to this, Avon Mind Center has been a recurring feature in creature decks in various formats since its printing and eventual reprinting into standard. However, based on the meta at hand, sometimes other options are more viable, and Avon Mind Sensor can be moved outright or cut from decks that might otherwise run it. This is especially true since these decks value as low of mana value on creatures as they can muster, meaning a 2 drop is generally preferable over a 3 mana creature like Avon Mind Sensor. This is especially true in Death and Taxes variants that have started to run an Extraction Specialist for more recursion, since Avon Mind Sensor is not a valid target to be brought back from the Graver for having too high of a mana value. Despite this, the effect is powerful enough that it still sees competitive play in various formats, I believe not with the frequency it used to. And at number 4, we have Bayful Strix. 
This bird is an artifact creature, yet still costs colored mana. Strix costs 1 blue and 1 black mana and has 1 power and toughness. Along with the almost compulsory flying that birds have, it also has death touch, meaning that any amount of combat damage it assigns to a creature is enough to kill that creature. Whenever Strix enters the battlefield, you can also draw a card. This is a rather simple card, but the fact that it replaces itself via card draw and then provides a decent defensive body was quite good for a lot of Legacy's early lifespan. While not an imposing threat on its own, it effectively traded with most of the threats of the format, and essentially was a slow kill spell that also drew a card. It still is used for that purpose somewhat, but generally speaking its competitive play in Legacy comes more from its combo potential with Alluring. This enchantment makes creatures with a mana value 3 or less free to cast, which combined with Cavern Harpy allows you to bounce the Baleful Strix back to your hand and recast it for free, creating an easily repeatable loop. Baleful Strix also sees play in Legacy Ninja decks since the Flying Death Touch is rarely ever blocked, allowing you to trigger your Eureka the Tiger's Shadow or other Ninja 2 effects and bounce the Baleful Strix back to your hand to draw another card. Essentially, the decks that use Strix as competitive decks use it as part of an engine to both draw more cards and then eventually win the game. And at number 3, we have Ledger Shredder. Printed in New Capena, Ledger Shredder is the newest bird on this list. It costs 1 generic and 1 blue mana and has flying and 1 power and 3 toughness. Whenever a player casts their second spell each turn, Ledger Shredder connives. Connive is a keyword ability that draws a card, then discards a card. If the discarded card was a non-LAN, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. This triggers both when you cast your second spell and also when your opponent casts their second spell as well. This means if both players cast two spells in one turn, the connive ability triggers twice. While this isn't direct card advantage, it is card selection. Digging deeper into the deck, the discard even actively considered drives the cards that need specific card types or cards in the graveyard like Unholy Heat. Blue and red aggressive decks already want low mana value aggressive creatures and ways to draw and discard cards. So Ledger Shredder essentially provided a consolidated package for all of this and more. As such, the card quickly took over multiple formats, seeing play everywhere from Standard to Legacy and even Vintage. It's not even simply relegated to those blue-red aggressive decks. One of its most consistent homes is in blue-white equipment decks in Eternal format, where it's one of the primary attacking threats of those variants of the deck. Even non-aggressive decks have begun to leverage the card, with modern Underworld Breach decks using Ledger Shredder as a way to fill the graveyard to pay for the escape costs and as a backup win condition through combat. Primarily, the deck wants to win via casting as many spells as possible in one turn via recasting them with Underworld Breach, which requires it exile cards from the graveyard to pay for its escape costs. Ledger Shredder provides fodder throughout the game in the graveyard for the eventual combo turn. The card has slotted into multiple archetypes in multiple formats and could arguably even take the number one spot. But the two cards ahead of it are just as influential in multiple formats, and since Ledger Shredder is so new in comparison, it only took the third spot on this list. And at number two, we have Birds of Paradise. This card costs one green mana and has zero power and one toughness, as well as flying, of course. It can be tapped to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. While this card itself is quite good, it also requires context behind. Birds of Paradise was first printed in Alpha, the very first set of Magic the Gathering. This makes it not only one of the first birds, but also one of the very first mana dorks in the game. As a creature that taps for mana, players quickly found that it was a very strong way to accelerate someone's game plan into stronger cards faster. The term Bolt the Bird would become an enduring phrase in the Magic community, because of the importance of killing mana dorks before the game got out of hand. Birds of Paradise became shorthand for mana dorks in general, and endured as one of the most playable ones for years. In fact, to this day, decks in Legacy and Modern still register Birds of Paradise. Of course, after all these years, it's got some strong competition now. Other mana dorks like Noble Hierarch trade off access to every color in exchange for bonus effects, or other decks outright forego the mana ramp altogether and aim for lower to the ground decks. It's because of this that Bird of Paradise isn't quite the top entry on this list. It's nowhere near as commanding a presence in Magic as it once was, but its history spans the entire course of the game, and is still one of the most powerful birds in the game, which makes it well deserved of the second spot. And finally at number one, we have Yorion Sky Nomad. Yorion is a legendary bird serpent that costs three generic mana, then two hybrid mana that can pay with either white or blue. Yorion has flying like all the others so far, but also allows you to exile any number of other non-land permanents you own in control when it enters the battlefield. At the beginning of your next end step, you return all those cards to the battlefield. This effect alone is fairly good. Mass bleak effects can be handy for reusing enter the battlefield effects or resetting the loyalty of planeswalkers that have gotten low. And while this is not a bad card by itself, what actually makes it so playable and worth the top spot on this list is that it also has the infamous companion mechanic. This mechanic lets the creature start the game revealed in your sideboard as long as you meet the deck building restrictions on the card. At any point, you may pay 3 mana to add this creature with companion from your sideboard to your hand, essentially meaning if you meet the companion's requirements, it can be an extra card you start the game with. Companion in general was extremely powerful, but Yorion in particular was one of the most playable. Its deck building condition requires the player to run at least 20 more cards in the deck minimum. 
In the case of all sanctioned tournament formats, this would mean a deck using Yorion would have to be at least 80 cards. This proved to be little to no problem for decks eager to use Yorion. In particular, toolbox style decks, or generally more grindy decks prefer to use Yorion as their companion of choice, since the extra 20 slots could go to more tech choices and varied options. Yorion saw play in every format it was legal in, and eventually was no longer legal at all in Modern. To this day, it mostly sees play in Legacy and Pioneer, seeing success in particular in Fires of Invention decks that play out many spells ahead of curve thanks to Fires of Invention cheating cards into play. Then, Yorion could be added to hand with the unused mana and cast for free to exile the Fires of Inventions, freeing you to cast the card stuck in your hand with your extra mana, then return the Fires of Inventions at the end step. Of course, any other creature on board with valuable Enter the Battlefield effects like Titan of Industry will trigger too. But it's not this specific deck that leaves Yorion at the top. It's the fact that Yorion works in essentially almost any deck. That if a deck could simply find 20 more playable cards for its strategy, and has the right colored mana for Yorion, it's essentially almost a freebie. Of course, not every deck can afford to run 80 cards, some need to find certain cards very consistently and can't delete their deck count, but for other decks, Yorion remains a consistent option, at least in the formats it's still legal in. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any cards you think we may have missed, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one? If so, go ahead and leave it on a comment down below.